So with that, we'll begin. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in this morning. Uh, my name is Dale Lutz. And I'm Tiana Warner. And we're broadcasting to you live from the luxurious broadcast studios here at the Safe Software headquarters in sunny Surrey, British Columbia. We're actually so sunny we have a drought now. Yeah, it's very warm out. It's great. It's, we can't yeah. actually even wash our cars, but uh, <laughs> for people in Vancouver, this is quite noteworthy. But anyway, today we're here to talk about something called the Data Interoperability Extension. This is an extension sold by Esri, as, uh, as any other extension is. It's different, though, in that it is made actually uh, primarily by Safe Software, those of us up here in Vancouver, and it is a subset of our flagship FME product. And so the things we're going to talk about today are actually all applicable to FME as well, but we thought we'd shine the spotlight on these corners of the data interop extension, that's our short form or just the interop, um, because a lot of people that have the interop don't know about these capabilities and they do complement very nicely the functionality in ArcGIS. So today in specific, we're going to be looking at about three or so scenarios with LiDAR and, um, and then some BIM and then some and then some uh, 3D things as well. So this is uh, our pictures. That's me actually in Africa. And that's uh, Tiana holding Bambi. Yeah, baby deer. Her name's Jane. Yes. <laughs> to my parents' backyard. And it's, um, uh, is that, that's actually used in uh, movies sometimes, right? Yeah. She's a, it's basically when you're Canadian, you just have a bunch of exotic pets like this. It's just... <laughs> actually, Tiana did grow up with a polar bear in her backyard, and I'm not, yeah. and that, that is that's, actually true. That's legit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's us. And as I hinted at, we, we at SAFE make a product called FME, which is, uh, stands for Feature Manipulation Engine. It's a tool set that allows you to quickly set up rules that govern the transformation and translation of data from wherever it is to wherever you want it to be. And so uh, to that end, we support like 350 some input formats or input and output formats, as well as a whole library of transformations, the so-called blue things that are in the middle. And so we use our product people to do it to connect to things, to connect to data that they have, connect to places they want it to go, transform it, and then lastly, there's a whole automation engine in there so that those transformations can happen hands-free, and that's what we do. And so the data interop extension is a subset of FME. It actually has, I think, a lot more than 130. The plus actually might mean plus like 70. Um, yeah, it's over in the next 10.3.1, um, there should be over 200. Yes, so uh, it tracks along, and it... Um, provides a, a nice complement to ArcGIS in terms of adding a whole suite of new formats. In the beginning, it was actually primarily around adding a lot of uh, deep OGC, GML, WFS support, and that, of course, is still in there, but there's very deep support for various CAD variants that um, the CAD stuff in ArcGIS won't get you, as well as lots of different JS formats, so deep XML support. Um, Point clouds, what we're focusing on today, 3D, BIM. Um, there's getting to be more and more raster in there and different databases too. Actually, Stephanie, if we can get you to chat out, there's, if folks actually are curious what's the difference between data interop and FME, we've put, prepared a web page for you to, to examine. I was going to challenge you to find the one typo on there, but the marketing team was in early and they fixed that. But you can kind of compare full FME with the data interop, and if some of you have the data interop, and you want to step up to the full FME, we have a complimentary little add-on package that you can buy that does that. But really, for all the stuff that you're showing today, I think that out-of-the-box data interrupt does the trick yeah, just does. about. Yep. There's a slight uh, untruth in that statement because I think for the last Minecraft demo, it'll be the next data interrupt that has all the functionality that's needed. Right. So if you have data interrupt today, uh, you won't be able to do any Minecraft stuff. You'll have to wait and dream. But when 10.4, I, I don't know what the next release is. Um, it should be, there should be 10.3.1. Okay, next, coming. Yeah. That, so anyway, we track along with the, with the releases, and we always ensure that each Esri point release has whatever the latest FME is and the functionality from that at that time. And so data, so the Minecraft stuff is what's coming in there, but Tiana's not afraid to show us a preview of it today. For sure. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, so, so yeah. The data interop, oh, that's what I just mentioned. Some of the additions, if you if you step up to um, the FME little add-on on top of data interop, you get these capabilities here. So we're going to 
pretend that you all basically know what data interop is, and Tana's going to jump right in and show us some demos in a few minutes, but we're not going to really cover data interop basics. We'll try to go slowly and, and kind of introduce that as we're going live, but we're going to focus right in on a set of different and interesting point cloud scenarios. So some of the key benefits that we can do uh, with the data interop integrated with ArcGIS, because ArcObjects is handy, we can actually make the so-called last D file or LAS directory file that ArcGIS likes to use. That, that's what you point at. So out of the box, ArcGIS doesn't actually work directly on LAS files. You first make a last D file that's a pointer to a set of last files, and then you can see them. And so when we're working with bringing data in from a variety of different formats, and on the bottom of this slide you can see a host of them, I actually uh, will also um, say that, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Tiana, you did that one, didn't you? Yeah, when I was a developer, um, I added the support for, I think, Rigel. Not, the, I still don't know. The Deutsche Zinnes, <laughs> Reigel or Regal, I don't know. But yeah. um, we should ask the audience if they know how to pronounce it properly. But nonetheless, the one that starts with R, Tiana knows inside and out because she actually wrote I it. did at one time. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. So that's one, um, and I know uh, in certain markets our support of that has been really, uh, really important. Um, the E57, E57 is like the Uber standard for point clouds. And, uh, and we do support that fully and all of its ins and outs. But LAS is really the granddaddy of them all. And there are two different compressed LAS formats. And there's some uh, controversy around that. If you want some interesting reading, go and search for LAS-ZIP versus ZLAS, I guess. We're Canadians, yeah. so we have a hard time saying Z. I might say ZLAS. Yes. <laughs> the ZLAS is the ESRI compressed. And we will, uh, because this is with an ArcGIS environment, we do have the option to make. Are you going to make some ZLAS today? Yeah, we, we will. OK. And so the other ones, uh, I think actually you're also going to do some TerraSolid today, right? Yep. We can, um, yeah, we'll have a look at that actually right now. We can uh, translate some TerraScan files to LAS compressed. OK. So uh, Oops. There we go. There we go. So okay. we're now looking at uh, ArcGIS. That was the big reveal. And uh, and tell us what you got and what you're going to do, Tiana. So yeah. So we'll look at how do you um, bring a TerraScan data set um, into LAS. We can do the compressed set LAS or ZLAS. Uh, we have multiple subdirectories. Let me just bring it up to show you. Um, so we have all of these subdirectories here with binary point cloud files, and they all make up one data set of an arena. So we want to translate that into LAS. So we'll open it up here in our catalog, and we'll use a spatial ETL tool. So I'll create a new spatial ETL tool. So that is the that's the key button that's or menu item that's added when you have the data interrupt extension. Yes. Yeah. And it pops up to this dialog, and so what do you do? And so we'll say we want to read LAS. And we'll Actually, you don't want to read LAS. Or, do sorry, we we'll want to read <laughs> you TerraScan. Want to make LAS. TerraScan. And we'll go find it. And data. So because we've got directories, we'll just grab one here. And then we want to use wildcards, so it reads all of them. So we'll say read everything that ends in .bin and read all of the subdirectories in there. And we'll leave the parameters the way they are. And so we want to write to LAS. And we'll write to C data output. And in the parameters, this is where we can specify yes. the compression. So we'll go to ZLAS. So ZLAS is the Esri only one. And the yeah. other one is the LAS zip made by our friend uh, Martin Eisenberg. So uh, it depends what you want to do. But if you make LAS zip, you can't read it directly in ArcGIS or the LAZ, right. but ZLAS you can. Yes. And we can tell you that these both compress like crazy. So yep. they are worth doing um, if you want to save space. So the rest of the parameters are good, so we'll click OK and let that generate. So this is going to make us a, a blank, not really quite blank, but a, basically a starting point for some transformation. Yeah, so it'll generate a um, straight conversion here from TerraScan to LAS and We'll just rename the output arena. Because that's going to be used as the file name? Yeah. So we've got TerraScan here. It's reading the entire directory and all the subdirectories. And we'll look at the parameters here in the output. Um, so you can see here the compression type we defined. And the other one we care about when working in ArcGIS is the last D file name. 
So that's the uh, Esri file that stores a reference to the actual last data set. So we'll call it arena again. And that's the only other parameter we care about right now. It's interesting there's about four, the next four parameters are all sort of higher end Esri related parameters actually, aren't they? Yeah, if you want to get more specific. Yeah, um, so to allow, to, if, you, if, you get, if you are someone that really knows or cares about ZLAS, you can get right in there and, and adjust many of these more advanced parameters. Now, if you hit run right now, I think you'd be unhappy. Can you tell us why? Yes, because we've got an entire directory of source files. So if I run it right now, we're going to end up with like a million output files. So we just want to add one transformation in here. Um, the point cloud combiner. Com so this is the idea of a transformer. For those new to FME or data interop, these are the blue things that we add in the middle that rearrange things. Now this, this one in particular takes many input point clouds. Basically there's one point cloud per file coming in. Yep. And its job in life is to turn all those into just one output one. Right. Is there anything to do in the parameters in this one or is uh, it all good? Nothing. We're all good. And if you want to know one last thing on transformers, on uh, the bottom left corner of Tiana's thing there is all of them. There's, so there's 390 yeah. available in this data interop release. Yes. So and there they all are. So there's lots of goodies. And throughout today, we're going to be grabbing various ones. We won't go browsing in here because Tiana has memorized all the ones she wants to use. Of course, yes. And just types them on there. Yeah. Including the, we're going to do one of the most famous ones a bit later. That super uh, long. yeah, super long, the longest named <laughs> one. If anybody wants to guess what the longest named transformer is ahead of that, we might give them a prize. Um, actually, our German, while I'm talking about that, our German friends have said it is Riegel. Riegel. So no, okay. no, uh, no I sound. Okay. So we've got this set up. We're reading a, I don't know, twelve or however many. We'll find out. And uh, point clouds, and we're going to combine them and make one. You hit the run button. Run. Yep. We'll let that go. Should be pretty fast. So you can see the feature okay, camp oh, coming wow. in here. So 24 we read. 24 coming in and one coming out. And it's just doing the compression step now. Right. So it is a multi-threaded compressor. So right now all of Tiana's CPU was burning away there. Yep. Okay. So we've got the output then. We can go back into our catalog here and we'll look at the output. So you can see it right there, the last D file. We can actually preview it in Arc Catalog. Um, we can also open Arc Scene and preview it there if we want to see the colors. Yes. Um, but what I'll do here is actually inspect it with the FME Data Inspector. Um, that's a lightweight inspection tool that ships with the Data Interop extension. Yeah. So you right click and inspect. It'll bring that up. And we'll look at the C last. And that should be good. So now, this is a, a lightweight tool that's part of the data interop extension that lets you check out what your data is before, after, and during a translation, really. Right. And so it has a 3D mode in it, and there it is. And, and um, we will, and so here's our output. This is the arena for the 75th annual Hunger Games. May the odds for be in your favor, is yes. that what we say? <laughs> so there so, it is. So um, I guess uh, Tiana went on set there with a scanner. Yes. Set it up and, uh, I was in the Hunger Games and <laughs> took a LiDAR scanner with me. And you managed to survive yeah. and bring the scan back out. Exactly. It was my one weapon. Yes. Actually, the, the truth on this one is that this actually started its life as a Minecraft model. Yeah, it was a fan-made Minecraft world, and we used FME to translate it into LAS. Yes. So it's that's why it's so evenly spaced too, because Minecraft yeah. is pretty evenly spaced. So um, if you click this I button here, you can inspect your points as well. So we can pan zoom around here. Um, you can see we've got some X Y Z values, the R G B. Um, in other point clouds, you might see the rest of the components too. This one has a return and number of returns value. Um, so yep. yeah, that is. So that's that actually demo. a really handy way if you want to drill in to get at what's actually in your point clouds, the data inspector does provide you a very, very robust way of doing that, yeah. especially for some of the formats like uh, E57 where the components, th these various things like intensity and so on that are there, those are a vocabulary defined by the various uh, data formats and the, the last is a fairly standard one, but things like E57 could have other components in them that we have to be aware of. Right, and we've got a user data one, which is more flexible. Yeah, can contain anything. Could put things in there. So that is that the end of that our first is that uh, demo. Yeah. So let's go back to the slides. And okay, click in there. So yeah. So what are the kinds of operations we can do? Well, we can thin point clouds. A lot of times people want to throw data away, and so um, 
I wouldn't say that our thinning is the most um, sophisticated. We basically just randomly throw data away, and we may do something better with time, but a lot of times there's so much data that randomly throwing some away is, is plenty good. Um, we can create surface models that you can output or make DEMs, and we can drape things on top of that. We can slice along a line, uh, so you take a vector line and we can slice vertically through a point cloud to see what's there to get a profile. We can, uh, a lot of point cloud files actually come with improper data extents. So the LAS file is wrong and then it won't display nicely. So we just go last to last and update the extents properly. Tana showed combining. Um, actually, um, one of the other ones, uh, we can set components uh, those various things we looked at, we could go and do calculations to derive classification. And again, there's tools out there that may do better jobs, but for some kinds of classification, we can definitely do that. We can, for example, overlay uh, a point cloud with some polygons that we know are building footprints and then set the classification on the parts of the point cloud that were over the buildings to building to be used later on. And the, so we, again, we can filter point by point and calculate point by point. We could offset uh, Z, for example, if that's necessary. We can actually reproject, too. I don't know if that's... Did we talk about reprojection? Um, I think we do later on, so we'll, we'll save that. Look yeah. at that. There we do. <laughs> Ring, rang a bell. So um, I, that's a common thing folks want to do is take a point cloud and reproject it into something more useful, especially some. there's some scanners that give us geocentric coordinates, which to basically tell us where in X, Y, and Z we are from the center of the Earth, which um, is sort of interesting but almost not useful ever in a mapping scenario so we can fix that with the so-called CS map reprojector the Esri reprojector uses the Esri algorithms to do it the CS map one uses an open source library um, that one can do geocentric CS map also can do some vertical datum adjustments because the earth is going or, or parts of the earth are going up and others are going down and um, and there's an earthquake they go up and down quickly and that does affect the quality of um, of the, uh, or at least the, the positioning and usefulness of data if you don't compensate for that. Actually, the Blue Marble folks uh, make a plugin as well that uh, that can be used to reproject called the Blue, Blue Marble Reprojector. They have a very extensive library. If you're into vertical reprojection, um, they're sort of the uh, Cadillac of that. The last thing I'll mention while we're talking about earthquakes and stuff, little known tidbit, uh, I've heard that very shortly all coordinates or all data sets are going to have to track when they were collected because the time that they were collected really is relevant uh, in terms of understanding what the Earth looked like at that moment so that we can make sense of it. For example, I've heard that in, in parts of Japan, stuff shifted by multiple meters after no that way. recent earthquake. Wow. So if you have measurements from before, they aren't going to line up with measurements now. And so, uh -huh. um, and same in that big bad one uh, near Mount Everest. Yeah. In Nepal, the stuff moves, and so um, you need to basically. We're going to have to keep track of when was the data collected, and that's going to be an important part of metadata if you're going to be doing reprojection moving forward. So there's your little tidbit of today. Fun fact. Yes. Tiling. A lot of times, people want to take a ginormous point cloud and chop it up into smaller pieces, and that's um, there's a tiler inside of the data interrupt. That's that's what it does for a living. And splitting. splitting. Chopping them up, not spatially, but based on different components. So taking the all the things that were known to be buildings, let's pull them out of there. The stuff that's, I think you worked with high vegetation in one of these? Yes, that's, uh, we're going to demonstrate that. Actually. I'm a little nervous. I'm coming from Vancouver. High vegetation could have other meanings. Um, but oh, yeah. it's, it's not... Uh, it's trees. It's, it's very it's, tall trees. It's very tall trees, yeah. not uh, other sort of plants that tend to grow <laughs> lots of places around Vancouver. Okay, so that, that's a kind of thing that we can split out. So let's have a look at that. There could be a market actually for splitting out where that sort of vegetation grows, at least to law enforcement. Maybe, yeah. And in, in Washington, Colorado, mm -hmm. too, maybe investors. Okay. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so let's... So you're going to get rid of that old spatial ETL, yes. spatial ETL tool. We're going to go... Back so, into our catalog. So what's our second demo about? Oh, we're splitting, and so what do you got? Yeah. So we're splitting. I have a point cloud of a county in Ohio, and so this is it right here, last file. We have the projection file next to it here, and we want to split it by the classification component. So we know that um, the value of one means it's unclassified, two means it's ground, and five means it's high vegetation. So we want to keep just the high vegetation. So we'll generate a new spatial ETL tool again, new tool, 
And so this time we are reading last. And we'll go find it here in this one, last while. That's good. And the output is fine like that as well. So we'll click OK. Let that generate. And once again, it'll, um, it'll give us just a straight translation format to format. This time it's just last to last. And again, we'll want to set the output last D file. So let me just copy this name. And we'll name it the same thing. Okay. And so the parameters should be fine the way they are. Um, I guess we can compress it, sure. Um, actually, let's not compress it this time. We'll just do normal. And the point or the uh, transform we care about this time is the point cloud splitter. So we'll add in that. And if we open the parameters, you can see we can split by any. Uh, any component here. So we will grab the classification and this is what unique values to keep. So we just want to keep five, which represents the high vegetation. Right. And so for those that don't know, the the last people have made a dictionary of all the different classification codes. And so you right. can look up in that dictionary. If you search for last classification codes online, you can see it. The other thing worth a lot of times is LIDAR files aren't classified. And yeah. so you wouldn't get away with this. So ahead of time, Tiana had looked in the data inspector and kind of browsed around in there and saw that many of them were tagged with uh, the vegetation classification. Right. And so here is where we could also, like if we wanted to split by a range of values, you can see here ranges to key. Yes. If we want to choose to split by color, we could say, okay, the range of anything that counts as yellow, we yes. can extract that. And so that was in the picture on our slides. Um, we can extract like just the road lines from a point cloud. So Let's click OK here, the classification, and that is it. So let's run it. It should be pretty quick. So yeah, one point cut in, one out, and it should be here in the output. So there it is. And let's actually have a look at it in Arc Scene this time. So we've got right here, we'll add data. And we'll go to output and grab that last D file that we generated. And there it is. So that's just the high vegetation that we grabbed. For reference, um, let's have a look at the input one. I'll just inspect that with the data inspector just to see the entire data set. Right, to prove that you did, you yes, did actually do something. I did something. <laughs> so here is, here's the whole thing. You can see, like, the actually, let's inspect the points. So this one. You can see on the side, uh, classification is two. Which I think is bare earth or ground or something. Yeah. It's, so we've oh, got there's one. I don't know. I don't remember there's being one and two. Um, yeah, one is, oh, wait, one is unclassified, two is ground. Okay. Yeah. So we've got ones and twos here, and then the trees are five. So that's that's what we extracted that we have here in the in arc scene. Right. So we split it apart. There's, so yeah. sometimes you do that kind of thing, and then you could make a surface model, for example, out of the other stuff. Right. So you got rid of the the vegetation, the canopy. I've heard of people doing things where they make a surface model of both parts and then subtract them and then that can tell them something about the amount of foliage that's there. Okay. All right. Good job, so Arc Scene. Here. All right. So that's splitting point clouds. Ah, one of my favorites is adding color to an otherwise dreary and drab world. So many scanners, many LiDAR data sets do not have color on them. They they just had maybe things like classification, of course, elevation and so on, but they were in black and white, they would have maybe an intensity. And so it is possible with data interop to overlay uh, the point cloud on top of an existing raster and then transfer the RGB onto the point cloud so that later on you can use the point cloud in living color. And right. so are you actually going to do that? Yes, we are. Okay. Demo. So let's close this. Close. Okay, so now we've got a, actually I'll use, I'll show you an art catalog. So we've got the same input data set, the last file, but we also have a GeoTIFF of the same area. So we want to overlay that. So we'll create a new ETL tool again. And okay, the input fine, output fine. Yeah. So we'll generate that same thing, last to last. 
And now we're getting, this is one of the parts of data interrupt that a lot of folks don't understand is you don't have to have just one input and one output. And you're going to show us some of the tricks there. Okay, you're going to yeah. not compress. So I won't compress again. We'll set the last D file. And yep, so we'll add a new reader. And this is to add another input. So um, I'll go find it. Notice that Tiana didn't specify the out or the format. If she just goes and finds it, automatically it guesses based on the yeah. extension. That's a good good best practice to, to do. Okay, and that'll add the second reader to our workspace. So we've got both of those. And then we're going to add a um, what so is we're going to do point point let's see. Cloud on. <laughs> PC. So here we're going to P point cloud P C O R. Okay. So you, oh, you can actually type it by type, camel case. Wow. So so that is okay. the longest named transformer in all yeah, of FME. So me and we've actually been that. accused of being on some high <laughs> vegetation by one of our <laughs> customers when we named that. And I can assure you that the person who named that was not. The person who named that is actually the multi-time uh, Tetris champion. Yes. In in at least the Seattle conference. So. He does not fiddle around. So there you go. It is explicit. So in general, what this thing does is it can lift um, anything off of a raster. So it could take uh, Z values and slap them on. We could have other things in a raster. But the most common thing that happens is we lift RGB onto there. Do you, want to, do you have to take yeah. a peek in the parameters? Yeah. So by default, it's set to do color, yeah. which is about the, yeah, there you go. Custom, yeah. So basically, yeah, when I use this, I don't even, you don't really need to open the parameters. You could just set it down and it kind of does the work for you yes. there. Yes. If you manage to, to get its name right, you've done enough work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay, so with that, you'll be lifting and colorizing. Do you have to do anything else or you just hit run? That's it. Um, yep, wow. that's it. So let's See, the, that's one thing about these LiDAR workflows is that they tend to be very short. If yes. you've seen lots of FME or data interrupt, a lot of times there's very big, complicated workspaces, but these LiDAR workflows are pretty, pretty um, sweet. So, so we'll have a look at it again in arc scene. While it's firing up, I'm going to uh, ask, somebody asked, is the data interop extension included for free with ArcGIS? Sadly, no. Um, you have to buy that on top of it like any other extension. Uh, but you can install it, and without licensing it, you get the ability to do some WFS things and some GML things. But if you want to do the stuff Tiana's doing, you do have to uh, buy it. But there's a free 30-day um, trial, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here it is, and let me just so that's turn the kind on of, RGB. And that's the exciting part. Yes. There we go. Ah. In living color, and that was a drab, boring, uh, uncolored. Yes. Now it actually looks like trees. Yes. There's our high vegetation. Yes. Okay. So that's that one. Okay. So now you've seen colorizing as well. So that kind of wraps up our little tour of all things... Uh, LiDAR. All things LiDAR. I'm just thinking last night my friend Carlos da Silva, who's on here, um, came across a four-year-old video of me yeah. showing some uh, LiDAR scenarios. And if folks are interested, um, maybe we'll get Stephanie to dig that out and, and, uh, and, and uh, broadcast that one because it's another th – that can be done with data interop as well. It's a little more involved. That one took 10 minutes to go through that particular demo four years ago, yeah. but I think it basically is still true, like all that I stuff think, works. Yeah, the same principles are there, Yeah. Um, so we can we can chat out. Uh, look on our Twitter feed stuff, I think, in the social media feed, you can grab it from there and share yeah. it. Yeah, Carlos, or my, I, I was retweeting it a little bit too, but the yeah. interesting thing was that um, in that one we ended up making a 3D PDF, which is always a crowd pleaser, because we yeah. take the LiDAR, we uh, drape the imagery on top of a surface, we make a surface and we put imagery on that, and then we uh, clip to something, and then finally output a 3D PDF. So it's an example right. of we didn't actually do any clipping today in our demos, did we? No. Because that's a comp that's where you would in the last example, Tiana brought a raster in and combined it with lidar. It's very common as well to bring vectors in, either areas or linear features, buffer the linear features, do something with the areas, and then bring them together. Actually, I lie because you're about to do that. Yeah, we'll have a look at some clipping this, in the 3D GIS. Right, because we're actually going to make 3D GIS. Yes. from LiDAR. Let's... Right. So with that as transition, um, the data interrupt comes with a whole bunch of facilities for creating 3D out of 2D. And that's what we're going to look at specifically today. And this can be used as a starting point for further work later on, perhaps with City Engine or other things um, that could do very cool um, future 
additional work. So in this example, Tiana is going to start with some 2D building footprints, and we're yes. going to um, yeah, we're going to make a tin. We're going to clip things out. It's quite. Are you going to make this whole thing from scratch, or just no, going to walk through? No, I'm just going to walk through. It. Okay. All right. Well, let's so uh, let's bring this up. So we're going to combine some ingredients and end up with 3D. Hold on. Let me. Okay. I've got the swiping action. <laughs> All right. Let me close this. So yeah, we're gonna have a look at this. Um, I have a lidar scan of um, a city. I don't really know where it is. Maybe I do actually. Yeah. It is. This is Grand okay. Island. Okay, I thought it looked familiar. So yeah, we've got a lidar scan of that area, and we have these shapefile outlines. So. So all of this that. is thank you public data of Vancouver. Yes. And let me just open. Vancouver the... Open Data rocks. Yes, it does. I use it a lot. Okay, so we'll open that. Detail tool. So this uh, we made ahead of time. Yes. Uh, so the point of this workspace is to create a surface model using the information from the point cloud here. So this is a point cloud. We want to use the height information from here and extrude the 3D building outlines. Let me. So the first that. thing you're doing is you go into that filter. Can we open up that point cloud filter because we haven't actually looked at one of those yet. So what you've done is set up some different expressions or rules. Like they could be arbitrarily complicated, but I'm not sure if we can make that a little wider so we could see inside there. Yeah. There, okay. You really, it's just saying, look, if it's six, we're going to output all the points that were six in one one route, and all the rest of them are well, actually not the rest, but the ones that were what one probably or two, two yeah. in the other. So we're we're basically taking one nice point cloud and breaking it into two. Yeah, so we've got buildings in the grounds. So the ground goes down here to make a surface model. We've got the tin generator, and then it just goes straight to the output. Yeah. But the buildings we're going to use in the clipper. Um, so the first thing we do is use the geometry extractor uh, for the yes. know, geometry information. So what Tian is doing there is she's hiding the build. Each building footprint is going to have its, its geometry turned into an attribute yep. temporarily. And be, it's because that is going to that geometry is going to be used as our clipper, and yep. we're going to clip the point cloud. So there's a new point cloud for every building, and so that's what's going to come out of this clipper. The point clouds are the clippies. The point cloud. There's one point cloud coming in, and multiple point clouds are going to come out via the inside. Those will be one little point cloud for every building. The problem is the geometry will have been replaced by the um, by the by the point cloud, but if she opens up that little triangle by the inside, we can see that this new point cloud is getting the attributes of its clipper on it. In particular, the underscore geometry, which was where we tucked the the full geometry temporarily. So now we're going to go. We have a point cloud with some nice attributes. We're going to get statistics on it. And someone's asking, um, is this stuff we're showing? Would it work in FME 2012? And many of the things would have worked, but not this one. Point cloud right. statistics came more recently, and it, it lets us do interesting calculations because lots of times birds or antennas or other things are on top of buildings, and so we don't we don't want them to skew us too much. So we're going to take the average um, yeah, height. So we, yeah, we would get the max, like the Z value, just to get the height of the building, but um, yeah, just in case there was a bird flying overhead when the scan was made or an antenna or something, we want to just get the mean value of the height yeah. instead for more accuracy there. Yes. So that's what we're doing in this transform. And so if you open up the output here, we can see that we added a Z dot mean at the bottom. So we've been slowly adding things onto this thing. Now we go and we put back, we've, we're kind of finished with our, our point cloud. We've got the value we want. So we put back the building footprint as the geometry and then immediately whack it so that it is a 3D extruded building. Right. And that in hand, ultimately, we output the whole mess. And which, where is your output format today? Uh, SketchUp. Okay. We could have gone into multi-patch inside of ArcGIS if we felt like it, but we thought, hey, we're doing some 3D things. Let's go to SketchUp. Yeah. So you can see there. Uh, let's open the output folder. And Tiana uses the little use little button there to... That open. was the first time I used it. <laughs> <laughs> and there, oh, I see you installed SketchUp since yesterday. I, I did. So I, Wow, so not only have you done a roundup and learned Minecraft, you're also you know, a SketchUp person. I, yes, I can vaguely use SketchUp, uh, I think. So let's... Wait, where's the zo zoom extents? Yeah, oh, there it is. Okay, so there, that's... We see all the lines of our surface model, but whoa! There it is. That's part of Vancouver. And so again, those um, buildings were extruded based on the results of a LiDAR scan. 
beautiful. Yeah, and that's why people would then use City Engine to start making it a little more pretty. Yes. This is a bare bones starting point, yeah. but it gives you an idea on, on what you can do. And of course, if you're doing shadow analysis or viewscape analysis, that's all you'd need is what we've just right. done there. That's so, that one. I love that one. It's pretty cool. Okay. BIM and GIS. All right. So in this next section, we're going to look at building information models and talk a little bit about how they can become, can find their way through the data interop to use inside GIS. This is an emerging and growing area. There are getting to be more municipalities and governments worldwide that are saying to developers, look, if you're going to build a building, great. You've got to give us a building information model when you're done. So there's getting to be more and more BIM data floating around. And the challenge and the uh, opportunity is how to extract value out of that complex data set that can to make it useful for decision making in GIS. And so often when you're thinking of BIM, if you're someone that works with Revit or you have friends that do, you really have two options. You can get an IFC file out, which IFC stands for Industry Foundation Classes, which is a standard way of representing building information models. Very, very complex. Or you can ask them to give you a DWG file, good old fashioned CAD, where you've probably thrown the baby and a whole bunch of other things out with the bathwater. You've lost too much. So somewhere in the middle, this is sort of like a Goldilocks situation. This one is too complicated. This one is too simple. You need the one that's just right. And FME slash data interop can give you tools to find that Goldilocks, Goldilocks scenario where you can keep what you want and discard what you don't want. And there's a great case study, and uh, I'm going to really make Stephanie sweat and work. If she can find <laughs> the URL, we could um, send it out to people. It was from the FedUC keynote. There was a case study of the, of the Mount Vernon home of George Washington and how a quality model was built in Revit, actually from a LiDAR scan. So an architect firm did that entirely in Revit. And then they got an IFC file and wanted to bring it into ArcGIS Pro via the data interop extracting just the parts that would be useful inside of ArcGIS Pro for purposes like understanding view shed analysis. We can go up and sit on the deck and take a look at what's happening in the world around and see if we build a nice big mall. Does that affect the view? Because we don't really want to do that, this kind of stuff. And also they were doing reasoning about where to do repairs. They were going to put a fire suppression system in. And by okay. being able to flip parts off and on in the GIS, you can help the, the people that are planning to do that work. So that's that case study. And Stephanie right now, I'm sure, is busy um, doing all of her searches uh, to find out. Chris had a blog on that one, too. If you just, if you go to safe.com and type Mount Vernon, we have actually a couple, we have, uh, I think, a couple presentations and a blog post on this. We won't find directions so. on how to get to the mall south of Vancouver. I don't think so. <laughs> That's when I first heard about this. Canadians know about Mount Vernon as a place where we used to go when our dollar was worth something oh. to buy stuff, like shoes and things, oh. but not anymore. I that, yeah. I, now Mount Vernon is the, the fancy place where we know that millions of actually tourists go every year. And I actually want to go there. It looks like a really cool place. It does. It looks really nice. So that's right. that's a real example. And um, well, we've done a webinar where I'm sure we talked about Mount Vernon as well. And you can go to FME yep. Lee, JS, BIM. If you really are interested in this, uh, we spent a whole hour looking at a bunch of different scenarios. Um, there's no, actually, we're kind of shortchanging people today because we didn't do a single thing with Excel. No. Excel is like the shape file of non-spatial data. <laughs> and um, Actually, Data Interrupt does a really amazing job of restructuring Excel spreadsheets, bringing them in, rearranging them, creating them from different things, deriving high-value multi-tab uh, Excel spreadsheets. And actually, in our webinar, we'll show you how you can actually integrate Excel and BIM, which is a common thing to do. Yeah, definitely check out that webinar because we have a lot of demos there that are pretty useful. Yes. So are you going to do a demo for us today, Tian? Yes, uh, we'll have a look at um, a workspace converting to GeoDatabase. Um, so this is the source Revit file that we worked with. Inside, so again, you brought it up in the Data Inspector. And let's be fully transparent. The reason Tiana has a screenshot is that a lot of times this BIM stuff is It's fairly, enormous. Yeah. Yeah. It took a very long time to, you can see on the side here, um, like almost 6,000 features. Complicated 3D features. So it looks very nice when it loads. Yeah, but you got, it's a little bit longer than we wanted to uh, put you through today. There's yeah. only so much I can blather on. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, here, okay. So what do you got? So I've got this, here's our Revit file. 
Uh, let me open the existing spatial ETL tool. I, I accuse this building of looking like a Motel 6. I don't know if it yeah, really is. I think it's like an office building. I'm not sure. We just we call it a fancy motel. I think it looks like if any of you have ever stayed in Redlands at the, um, I think the Red Tin Inn or whatever it is that all visitors to Esri stay at, I think this is the building. I Could don't be. know that. I don't know that. <laughs> So be. these are the three feature types that we grabbed. Um, so you remember over in this picture, these are all the possible feature types. Um, we only cared about a couple of them. We cared about the roof, the wall, and slab. So that's it. Let me run that. Um, so it'll still it still takes a little bit to run because it's so huge, but it's easier on the output end to inspect because we've kind of simplified it a bit, and that'll just load it into uh, GeoDatabase for us. Yeah, the most common thing people do when going to JS from a Revit model is throw things away like crazy. Yeah. The key is knowing what to throw away, and so inspecting ahead of time in the data inspector is very useful to help you decide what parts because most people that are JS people don't wake up knowing the, the IFC data model. They right. don't know what a slab is. That's I think of slab sort of as typically from um, Frankenstein movies. Yeah, I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I think in, for architects it's like floors, but I don't know. We'll yeah. find out. Actually, you'll be able to flip it's it on kind and of off. Floors, yeah. Uh, so this is the output. We just the geometry type. It kind of it detected it itself. I didn't really have to do anything. It was just a multi-patch. Well, see, this is what it's going to require me to break into song here. I was thinking of the, I was working in the slab late one night. Oh, yeah. When my eyes beheld an eerie sight. It so was that's, a slab. That's okay. But it could be a monster <laughs> mash thing. Let's... I can hear Tiana's go. fan roaring up on her you know, laptop. No, my laptop's really warm right now. Well, when, you, when you're working with BIM models, there's a reason why, for example, Revit only runs on 64-bit, or at least is only seriously considered to work on 64-bit today because these things are big and complicated and even though we're only playing out part of it it's a lot of work to stitch together the pieces of the IFC file. IFC is actually like a relational database in an ASCII file. There you can see the numbers roaring by. There they go. Um, there's a few of them. So that was a minute 38 seconds. It shows you that if we're doing demos that are more than a minute then I have to start singing. Yeah. So let's open our... The little blue thing is telling Tiana that she's throwing some data away, which, yes. yep, we did that intentionally. Yes, I did. And now we're going to make our scene sweat a little bit. It'll be okay, though, because we we have thinned it out, so I just need to add... I've got three feature classes to add, and they're pretty um, simplified now. So here's our fancy motel geodatabase. I'll grab these and add them. And that's it. It's loaded already. There we go. So there, It's not as pretty, but this is exactly what we needed. Right, and with. so we've worked with um, some customers that uh, that have there's the uh, slab. There's the right. slab. They are kind of the floors. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. So the roof, roof's pretty plain. Roof, roof is what you'd expect, <laughs> and uh, the walls are what you expect. Sometimes yeah. we keep the windows and doors, but. Uh, often people then take this and begin to do routing kinds of exercises. Um, there are, if you've watched that BIM webinar, we do things where we can extract the, the 2D floor plans of every floor and then just stack them one above the other so they all have a Z value that corresponds to their um, story. So they're 2D features stacked um, vertically, but they're not, these are true 3D solids, multi-patches basically. But this is the kind of thing that, that uh, people begin to do. Yeah. And I totally think this looks like where I stayed when I was last in Redlands. I was on the bottom floor. There's a swimming pool in the middle. So there was, yeah, there was the door, swimming pool right here. I think there's a swimming pool we right could there. Could add that. So anyway. So about there. Okay. Right, so that's that one. So there's our um, just a taster to basically make you aware that you can do stuff with building information models with the data interop extension. And we've been very pleased to work with Esri to have that be successful, and we look forward to doing more and more in this area as time goes on. At SAFE, we're still pouring into the IFC area. Actually, we didn't talk about this, but you can, with the latest data interop, you can export to IFC. Okay, yeah. Um, and that's that's a, not a trivial thing to do because IFC is a predefined data model. You have to know what you're doing. You have to understand uh, the voca vocabulary. But there are customers out there that want to make what they call a slim BIM, which is a starting point BIM that they're going to take stuff from the GIS so that there's some context maybe in a larger area, 
create an, a, a starting point IFC, they huck that over to their friend who's an architect, that friend brings it into Revit, now they've got a starting point, they can build their wonderful building. Typically architects um, could use with some context, they tend to work in a vacuum, they tend to work at zero, zero as well, which mm -hmm. causes JS people heartache afterwards. By giving them a slim BIM with some context, maybe they can make your life a little bit easier. And that's something that later data interrupts can do, and in that um, webinar I think we show that. But now I know that this is what you've been waiting for for, for yes. really months, <laughs> and that is to um, do some Minecraft stuff. So somebody's asked, what is this Minecraft thing anyway? So Tiana, since you're an expert, do you want to explain? Um, <laughs> it's a game that you, there's blocks, <laughs> and you can move around, and <laughs> I know from um, a safe software perspective that is basically an evenly spaced point cloud. Yes. But I can't say I've spent a lot of my spare time playing it, <laughs> but, uh, other than yesterday. Right. So, uh, if actually, ironically, Tiana's the first one to use the, the properly purchased safe software um, Minecraft license. Yeah. Because we've been, until this point, <laughs> using the license of our tween aged sons and daughters to uh, to do all of our testing and we figured you know what we probably should grow up here a little bit and have our own license but if you have people in your lives between the age of probably 8 and 14 um, almost certainly independent of gender they will know of Minecraft and have done amazing things in it and um, actually someone's son was here yesterday who was it he was the yeah. one who taught me how to use this our chief scientist son, yeah. Yeah, Logan. he, uh, yeah, Logan. He came to my office and had to teach me how to use it a little bit because I didn't. I yeah, didn't he's. Know. I, I think he's 13. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, and there's been a lot of work done. So, so Minecraft was like Lego blocks, basically inside of a very um, crude, actually, environment with a with a wonderful networking model to it and so on and a beautiful business model, a one-time 20 euro fee and you're good for life and the, um, the company was outrageously profitable, been bought by Microsoft now for billions of dollars and um, you're going to see it, it, Microsoft pumping this up as we move forward. But some of our inventive Scandinavian partners realized they could put spatial data in there and they started yes. that a couple of years ago. You've written about this a few times. Yeah, yeah, it's um, pretty cool. You can, I think a few different businesses now have been using it for like geo planning, kind of getting the younger generation involved. Um, if you bring your existing data of like cities or parks or whatever into Minecraft, then kids can create or destroy or you know do anything they can imagine in this world. And in turn, you can you know you can export it uh, back into whatever data type you're using or um, I don't know, just garner interest in the younger generation. I think a lot of kids too, like Dimitri has a video of a roller coaster he built on Mount, Mount Rainier. Rainier. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Stuff like that. So, or volcano eruptions or yeah. exploding goats. Right. Whoops, we don't talk about the exploding goats. That's <laughs> no. Dimitri's been banned from going to Sweden oh. <laughs> now, I think. It actually made the Swedish local paper his video of the yes. exploding goat yeah. where they they were disgusted at this outrageous act. <laughs> but um we're going to show you how you can combine, if you have patience and time, um, you, the tools are there for crafting gorgeous Minecraft worlds using the upcoming data interop or FME Today. So let's take a look. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is the, the palette. Uh, as a cartographer, um, Tian has got on the slide the block types. And so within the mental model, if you're a GISE geek, if, if you've gotten to this point in this webinar, you probably are a GISE geek, you are happy to think of a, of a Minecraft world as a regularly spaced meter by meter point cloud where one of the components of that point cloud is the block type to use. So if I want something that looks like a ladder or a train track, that's 65 or 66 down at the bottom. Um, TNT has a number in here. So you can basically do tricky things to set components based on vector and raster data and then ultimately when you get that all the way you like with your right X, Y, and Zs on there, slap that into Minecraft and now you've got yourself a beautiful world. Okay, this one I think you're not going to create from scratch. Oops. No, I, I mean I could, but, oh, Whoop. sorry, my swiping is not, not participating here. Swipe. It's not, it's not happening. There, there we go. go. I think I have these four fingers to swipe, maybe. <laughs> Anyway. We'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's close this again. So yeah, I, w I won't create it from scratch. There's a few transformers in it. Just so this few. is, we got to give credit, it was Dimitri who's yeah. off on vacation 
um, has done this, and he took an island near Vancouver where he could get a bunch of data for called Bowen Island, just a beautiful little island. That um, have you ever biked around Bowen Island or been over there? I've been over there yeah. once. Yeah, it was really beautiful there. Yeah, people do live there and commute back and forth to Vancouver all the time. So we got an elevation model. What are the ingredients in this thing? And we got an elevation yeah. model and map info. So let me uh, just show you here in our catalog. We have this elevation model. There it okay. is. Woo. Uh, and we've got some GI or yeah, some GIS files. Um, we have a map info tab of forest polygons. That's actually the data interop in action showing us the map info tab yeah. directly. We didn't even talk about that, but that's the, through the magic of data interop you can see that these are forest cover polygons. Yeah. Okay. And then we have some shape files, uh, some lakes, rivers, and roads. Right. So we're going to bring all of those in in this workspace. And so the goal of this workflow is to uh, rasterize all the all these vector layers before going to the output point cloud. So this happens here in this custom transformer. Um, so we're reading in the all the vector information in the digital elevation model. And before that, we are basically, all of this is preparing the vector data yeah. um, by buffering the linear features so nothing is kind of fighting for the same space in the point cloud. Right. So we've got the shorelines. We, we basically have to make it blocky. Yes. So we've got to buffer it up and then turn it into a raster. We've got to take away the detail, and that's sort of the irony. It's, it's a very crude resulting model, but that's sort of the magic of it. It just works. Yeah. So all of this stuff, and then, so this is the other interesting part is uh, the Minecraft styler, this custom transformer. This is the part that assigns the block ID and block data if you pipe, attributes. If you open it up right now, right, okay, it's a great big long list. So one day we'll maybe have little pictures in there too. Wow, a jungle fence, I wonder what mm -hmm. that is. Not really sure. There's everything you could ever imagine. And yeah. so basically we're taking different of the vectors that we've buffered up and fiddled with and then giving them a Minecraft property so that ultimately when we make our raster it's going to have uh, basically the cells of the raster are going to have the Minecraft property that's to be used. Yeah, and so we're going to turn the, the raster pixels into points then um, and the elevation and color are turned into the respective point cloud components. Right. And then we just output it. Yes. So we can... You can actually run it. We can run it. It runs. It works. Let's go to the front and look at the numbers fly by, because yeah. they, they must be... Um, um, let me just zoom out a bit here. Okay, yeah. So yeah, there's, you can see them coming. There's a bunch of forests coming through here. I love this, all the numbers going by. You can see exactly what's happening. Yeah, it's really helpful. Uh, 400. Oh, those are the roads. I believe. Right. So all of they get styled and they all get pumped into that same rasterizer and that's where the magic is happening. Yeah. Oh, and the Minecraft writer is busy working already, I can see. Yeah. So oh, there's can... tiling going on in there too. Actually not. I think Back takes... inside there. If we can just take a peek inside the Minecraft rasterizer. Oh, I don't know if you want to look in there. <laughs> Right. Oh, it's not so too bad. It's rasterizing numerically, so it's taking vector data and creating numeric raster, and then it's doing a combiner to um, to basically bang them all together. Down at the yeah. bottom here, yeah, lots of point cloud operations, lots of raster operations. So it's basically crafting this regularly spaced thing, and so yeah, there we go. I think this takes like a couple minutes to run. Okay. I don't think it's too long, but we can... Um, I don't know any songs that go with this. Oh, it's so. done. Okay. So we just generated all of Bowen Island in a Minecraft world. Okay. And... So now, so, so well, you're going to look at these slides, you're going to yeah, go for the real we, thing. Okay, are you ready for this? Are Let's, you ready for this? <laughs> Minecraft. Okay, wow. Okay, so I'm going to load the world that we just generated. Um... Is Logan standing by in case you need him? <laughs> this is the third time I've ever launched Minecraft. So there's our Bowen Island Minecraft world. Okay. Play. It sometimes plays little so Okay. Yeah. Oh, there so it starts to So you can see form. I definitely know what I'm doing because I'm like in the middle of the air. But I know, okay, there. Okay. okay. So there's our, you can see there's our rivers, our uh, GIS features, and our road GIS features. So we could actually plan our bike trip around Bowen Island. Yeah. It's everything's easier to see from the sky, so I'm just gonna stay here. I'm not really sure how to land either, but yeah, there's our world. I think if I there's a oh, okay, now I'm going down. Oh, okay. You, you've hit hard. I think you've planted flowers. Flowers, yeah. Everything's growing really nice. You can see the trees. 
So there and there's it nice, is. there's soothing music playing. What happens if I go in the water? Does he drown? I don't know. I'm just gonna I think fly you can walk again. On water. I I like it from the air better there. But okay. the point is, you can use this palette to create shockingly realistic worlds. One of our customers in Norway has a website up there. I, I don't know if it's publicly available, and I don't know if I want to torment Stephanie to to chat out that link because I don't know if she could find it. But it's um, a map of Norway. You pan and zoom around on the map, and then you draw a little box, and it makes you a Minecraft world of that area. And that's all done using FME slash uh, the same technology as this underneath. And I think that thing has cranked out thousands and thousands of Minecraft worlds of parts of Norway. And Norway is interesting terrain because all yes. those cool fjords and things. Okay, here we are down at the flower bed again. Sometimes I know you see horses in here. Have you run into a horse yet? No. I wonder, are there horses in the one? Okay, I'm killing flowers now. <laughs> but I would like to try riding a horse on here. Oh, I think this is where I started. You dug a little or hole there? I'm not actually sure. I might have dug a hole. I'm okay. not sure. So, all yeah, right. There. <laughs> well, let's get out of this. Let's uh, kill that because I know it sucks all your CPU. So anyway, it's interesting... Uh, again, when you look at this, you can go, if you want your own Minecraft maze, you can go to, uh, we've got one online there on yeah. um, the maze generator, but you can see the different kinds of scenes that we've created. All of that will be possible with Data Interop as well. So, uh, go to the next slide. Oh, we're all done. Okay. Yep. So, if you liked what you saw today, um, there's free training available at any time on FME. If you're a Data Interop customer, all that stuff basically by and large applies. Not the small yeah. world stuff. Small world is not part of the data interrupt. Not but, so much. But, but the basic FME desktop stuff would apply. Yep. Al although if you want a variation of it, your course that's online on the virtual campus would probably yes. be a better place to start. Yes. Um, I think the virtual camp, the Esri virtual campus, I think is like $32 for yeah. the courses. So it's pretty, um, pretty cheap. Pretty cheap, yeah. Um, so that stuff, yeah, is really good. And then, of course, the FME desktop training um, We'll give you some best practices for using the spatial ETL tool. If you want to learn more about the actual, um, like the rest of the data interop extension, kind of the quick import, quick export, the other components of it, uh, you can have a look at that in the Esri training as well. I think we've got some links here. Um, yeah. Yes. So these are the names of the courses transforming. But again, if you just search spatial ETL on training.esri.com, you'll be able to find them. And they were authored by me. So you can hear my voice again in the videos. Yes. So these are a variety of links. Uh, many have asked, are we going to be sending stuff out afterwards? Yes, if you've uh, signed up for this webinar, you'll get a recording of the webinar. All these slides will be available, um, so yep. you can visit these links later on. Um, the, uh, ex the All of this data that you used is all public data, so we can make it uh, available as far as I know. Is that the plan? Yes, I believe it is all public. Yeah. I took Yeah, I took all the data from... Uh, just existing FMEpedia articles, yes. or knowledge base articles. Yeah. Um, so if we've got tons and tons of resources on Minecraft and um, BIM data and everything, so if you have a search on our knowledge base, you can find lots of examples. Some folks uh, did say that we lost them when we walked through the um, the Minecraft uh, uh, workspace, and it is true. That, it is, is a true. little bit complex. It took me a bit to, because it was authored by Dimitri, who's a Minecraft pro, and an FME pro, so it took me a little bit to figure it out too, but um, we do have it actually, if you go to the bottom link here, FME lead slash Minecraft, um, you can yes. download the workspace yourself, and Dimitri has a little explanation of what's happening, so you can kind of poke around that yourself if you'd like, and I think he included the data as well. Yeah, it, it is, it's more involved, because it's almost a cartographic exercise when you're making Minecraft stuff, and so it does get a little more intense to get the result just right, but once you have that example, you could take uh, and easily swap in data of your own yep. to uh, to work to do the similar thing. So let's see. You know, uh, we've got only a couple minutes left. Any questions we should highlight? Let's see. Is there a demo workspace for this anywhere? People are asking. And yes, on that link that Tiana said. Actually, do you want to just yes. go to that site? We can try going there. Yeah. Ooh, it's a dangerous goat. <laughs> that we blow up, but anyway, this Lots. this is that site that goes through fairly slowly, step by step, telling you how you would go and um, do this kind of stuff. Yeah. So here's uh, this is the last example here. So all of this, he's explaining the workspace, what you need to do. Um, so here's Bowen Island. Oh, okay, I get it now. So I guess when you generate the world, um, it's blank, and then all the trees and flowers grow in yes. one Minecraft day. Oh, very cool. 
Yeah, the, the worlds change actually yeah. after you after you create them. So if you come back tomorrow, it could look the forest will be thicker. Yeah, yeah. I'll need to clear some more flowers out of the way. Yes. Uh, so yeah, Bowen Island. There's the picture. So yeah, he um he wrote a lot of uh, really good notes here. If you want to have a look at that, and some BIM. Somebody's asking, how is it that they can select the um, how is it that they can select the uh, the the data types they want when they're going from BIM to GIS? Do you want to just quickly see if you can swipe? Swipe. Oh man, I'm really bad at this. There we there go. There you go. And so if you made a new workspace that would go, um, let's see, how does that work? You. Okay. So um, sorry, what was the question? So how do you just pick a few of the of the feature types when you're going BIM to GIS? Oh, okay. Let's generate a new one. So we'll just show that and then we'll wrap up because I know we're almost out of time. So so Tiana's picking Revit. She's gonna go find that. There we go, the fancy motel. You'd have to hit parameters, I think, to pick which. I think uh, well, in parameters you can choose what kind of. So if we choose building like the entire building on this entire key, yeah. that'll give us. Um, we can also just choose building spaces. Right. I've done that before too, but we'll just get all of them. And then pick um, like, or did you hit OK? Oh yeah, that's okay. We won't okay. worry about the output. We're not. Format. The output will just be whatever. But um, yeah, as soon as you generate the workspace, it gives you the yes. option here. So and you that's can, where she knocked them off. Yeah. So I just chose none, and then at the bottom we'll choose like wall, roof. So it's pretty yeah. simple, pretty yeah. straightforward. So I think that's it, folks. Um, thanks so much for tuning in today, and I hope that this has given you a bit of insight as to some of the more advanced and, quite frankly, uh, astonishingly powerful things that the Data Interop extension can do within an ESRI context to complement the work you do inside of ArcGIS. Um, it also, I hope, gave you a taste of what FME, the sort of parent product, is capable of more generally. And so I want to thank you, Tiana, for all your work on thank all you. of this stuff, for helping our Data Interop customers get the most out of their, out of their um, investment. And, uh, I'm going to be a Data Interop Pro, no time. An ArcGIS Data Interop yeah. Pro. Yeah. Have to watch out, ArcGIS Pro is the name of product. <laughs> <laughs> Professional. Yes. Or maybe that's the same thing still. Yes, but, we look yeah. forward to bringing this. Uh, actually, this functionality is coming into ArcGIS Pro as well. So, um, yes. So we'll, we'll be pleased to, to do that too. So anyway, thanks so much. We'll hang around a bit longer if anybody else has questions. But if you need to leave, uh, go ahead and uh, goodbye from Surrey. See you later. And now is the part where we kind of just hang around and see if there's any other questions. Okay. Let's see. How do you define the colors when classified? Hmm, I don't know. The, the colors with the, colors when classified. With the true colors of the area. The somebody asked, this may be related, but the um, if you set RGB, they asked mm -hmm. if it blows away the classification. It does not. No. They're different components. Yeah, they're different. So that might be what um, this person is getting at. Let's see. Do we handle world files, WLD files? The answer is yes. yes. So if rasters have WLDs, we'll do that. Um, I think actually we do support it for a lot of 3D formats because sometimes, little known geek trivia, many 3D formats are not double precision floating point. Okay. They're single precision. And that causes heartache when you move to things like UTM, which have very big numbers. And so they get rounded off and do bad things. But the solution mm -hmm. is to use um, world files. Yeah. Somebody is so surprised they just say that they have doubt that it's true. <laughs> it's all true. If, is there anything fake that you did it's here all, today, Tiana? Nope. It's all real. Yeah. Oh, when somebody's asking, what's the difference between LiDAR and compressed LiDAR? Um, one is compressed. <laughs> no, the, the, it, is, it is the case that the compressed is lossless. In both okay. cases, um, somebody's asking, do you lose points when you compress? No. No. They are truly doing analysis and tricky things and um, not losing any points. You can thin. Thin is a way to, uh, to get rid of data, but that's not compressing yeah. it. It's chucking stuff out. The, these two compressors are absolutely lossless. Right. Okay. Simple clip. Okay. So they're doing a clip using a feature class area of interest on a last file and a last to last. 
it runs but the geometry is empty. I think the most probable issue if you were clipping, um, and I might ask you, Tan, do you got, do you got a, a polygon data set somewhere? Um, we could just fire one up here. Yeah, let's, I think we've got polygons um, in that Minecraft one. So should actually, I just... Or you know, you're yeah, actually, if, if we, no, if we go to the shape to sketch up one, because that's okay. polygons. Okay. But I think the person's problem, the most likely thing that's going to go wrong is that they're not in the same coordinate system. Right. If, if your last file was not in the same coordinate system as your, um, as your uh, outlines, then you're in trouble. And one way we often do this, let's show them how in the data inspector, our data inspector is coordinate system unaware. So if you inspect one of them, and then we'll add data to it. So inspect the shape file, and there we go. And now if you go and add the last file in there. And we're going to, yep, whichever one was good, yep. And there we go. This gives us happy confidence that they're actually on top of each other. Right. And so uh, to the person that's having trouble with the clip, I would say 90% of the time when I've seen that problem, actually you can reorder these, right? If you drag the outlines on top, there. That, that gives us the confidence that, hey, these things are in the right coordinate system. If they're not, you need to reproject. I would suggest it's faster to reproject the clipper than it is to reproject the point cloud. Um, and actually, let's just show, if you're in FME, if you had to reproject, Tiana would just highlight one of those lines and then type reproject and then pick her reprojector. Although, yeah, in this case, we want the ESRI. Yep. And then you go in here and fill in the parameters. Um, and still give us the ESRI dialog. Yeah to uh, point and choose. Yeah. So that's my suggestion. Oh, Josh says they were in the same state plane. Then if they don't um, work, you're probably going to have to send it in to support and we can take a peek. So somebody says, can they have the URL to the data? I think Stephanie will promise to send the URL out to everybody. I think when we, when we archive this, the, there's a zip file yeah. of all the stuff that always gets put up. Yes. So yes, we will do that. Hmm. So uh, anyway, yeah, Josh has got some interesting problem that we'll have to work with him on. Okay. So um, anything else that's interesting? Brian, do you want to chime in? Was there any other interesting questions we didn't uh, quite hit? Um, Dale, we... there seems to be a lot of interest in the building model, like particularly related to attributes and pulling that data out. So um, oh, right. certainly that was an area of interest from a number of people. Right, we didn't actually touch on that at all, but actually that, you've got, a, I think, a workspace up here that was the start of a, what, no, we actually we closed Which it, one? We? The one that you just generated. Yeah, actually, do you have it, you can just open up your, your um, BIM one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the one that Tiana had made ahead of time. Um, we didn't actually show them that there's a wealth of data in here, like if you crack open the little triangle, this is mm -hmm. stuff that means something to people. And um, we're scared of it, but if but if you want to, you can begin to pick out of that different parts and then uh, rename it along the way into something useful. Let's just yep. cancel this. I'll show. We'll slap down an attribute renamer in here. There we go. And then if you'd enter on that thing, this would let us rearrange that schema so that we'd pick like thickness there, the one down. And then we'd have something a little less verbose, like just maybe thickness as a name, right? And so now we've re so you kind of can do this sort of thing to restructure it. There's no substitute for elbow grease, though. You can see that there's a lot of variations. You have to go through a lot of work to get this set up. But the wonderful thing is, if you set it up for one IFC file, generally it works for all of them because IFC is a fixed data model. It is not different one to the next. So um, that's great. Thanks, Robin. Anything else, Robin, that we should uh, point out before we say goodbye? There's still 174 people listening. Thank you so much, yes. everybody. Yeah, so what, what versions of IFC do, you, so do we support? So someone talked about IFC Express. Do you know? I, can I found that we don't support IFC 4.0, but not sure about IFC Express. See, yeah, you know, this is outside my, I know that there was IFC X2.3 and X2.4. I kind of think that those are what we do right now. You don't know, Never. yeah, we need to, we'd have to get back to somebody about that, but I think we support the step, yeah, the STEP IFC 2. Dot something. I know that um, our writer has been architected <coughs> Ooh, to 
to do more, but um, that's that's what we're at right now. Yeah, that's what it kind of looked like to me when I went through the uh, problem reporting system. Yes, yeah. There's, a, there's, I think some of those are not quite finalized, and in general, it's safe. We try not to spend time on non-finalized specs because if one thing, if there's one thing standards committees love to do, they like to change their minds. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, which causes huge amounts of grief for us. Yeah. So that's why we have an army of developers here, just keeping on top of the ever-changing specs of things. Yeah. So you just, just have a look at. Um, you think it'll show information here? No. <clears throat> no. All right. One wishes that it did, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I do have my mic, uh, guys. I found my mic and hooked it up. Um, there was a good question there about the Revit exporter. Maybe that's worth a mention. Oh. Just about Revit exporting and getting uh, the data you want out of that and into something like IFC. Sure. So, so that's that plug-in thing that um, I think that there's a web page. Basically, the issue is this. Um, you cannot read Revit RVT files directly anywhere outside of the Revit environment. So when SAFE says, or when FME or Data Drop says we read Revit, it's that is actually a small um, misspeak, uh, perhaps, <laughs> um, because we don't really read Revit uh, directly. What we do do is uh, provide a plugin for Revit, and we'll just go searching around on our website, Tiana. Let's look for our Revit. Uh, exporter plugin that you install that needs no license. You go and install it. Um, there we go. And there must be somewhere on this page where we can uh, get to that. There it is, that bottom one. The that thing there. This thing um, lets you uh, hit a button inside of Revit and produce an RVZ or RVZ file, which is a combination of IFC and as well a bunch of other information that we think IFC missed. And so um, Knowledge Base has a nice article about this. About There we go. We can see the picture. It adds that button, and then that's how we do it. And we work with these guys, and we'll, I'll get you to make another tab and look for um, RTV tools. They're dyslexic. Um, and these guys make productivity tools for Revit that, among other things, they have this thing called Exporter Pro, and our Revit exporter is part of that thing, so this that one I think, yeah. And and this thing uh, basically is a way of batching a bunch of exports to a bunch of different things, including our uh, RVZ file. So basically, you can set this up and um, tell it to go at 2 in the morning, and it fires up Revit at 2 in the morning, an invisible hand points and clicks, and in the morning when you arrive, your directory of 1,000 Revit files have been turned into 1,000 RVZ files for use with FME, or it can do a bunch of other exports as well. But we love those New Zealand guys. It's very inexpensive, and um, they're very clever because RTV tools would be a copyright violation, but by switching it, yeah, RVT would be bad. RTV is okay, and most of us <laughs> can't tell the difference. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a cool logo Close, yeah. based on very a TV. Snazzy. So, yeah, great. Great one to mention, Brian. Thanks. Anything else, Brian? Um... Nothing that I see at the moment. Okay. I think with that, um, we'll again uh, just emphasize to people that a recording, Stephanie usually gets that recording between her and Robin. They'll have that recording out, I think, by the end of today, but we'll give them till tomorrow. You'll be getting an email from us with a link to the recording, with a link to all the data, with a link to where the slides live, and um, you should be able to play it back in slow motion. Uh, but be in touch with us. If uh, You can go to and do live chat on our website if you have questions that come to mind. Otherwise, I think Tiana and I are going to go um, and have some well-deserved breakfast now. Yes, coffee. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Tiana. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Robin. Thanks.